everyone. I am here today to talk about The Crimson Petal in the White by Michelle Faber. I was kind of reading this book alongside a bunch of other booktubers. They all had decided to do this as a buddy read this month and I was unaware of that. So I happened to find someone mention the buddy read and I happened to be reading the book at the same time. So while I wasn't an official participant in the buddy read, I was sort of a voyeur in the Voxer conversation and I've been watching all the review videos, so it's been really fun, even though I wasn't really directly involved. I've really enjoyed watching other people discuss this book, but I'm hesitant to throw in my two cents because the, the unanimous response I've heard about this book is love. People adore this book. And that's not to say that I didn't really like this book, but I didn't love it. I, I quite enjoyed it, but Perhaps this book just came for me at the wrong time, or maybe I just, it wasn't the perfect book for me. I think that it, timing was not on the Crimson Petal and the White side, because the book that I read right before the Crimson Petal and the White was A Little Life by Hanya Yanagihara, which is a book that absolutely destroyed me emotionally, and I loved so completely that I don't think anything would have ever released it up next to it, but having read The Crimson Petal and the White in A Little Life Shadow, I think it was at a disadvantage. Another disadvantage that this book had was that right before A Little Life I read The Fair Fight, which is another book that takes place in Victorian England that I absolutely loved. So I think both of those factors perhaps set The Crimson Petal and the White up to fail a little bit. That, that's not to say I didn't really like it. I did. I gave it four stars. So I'm going to stop talking about those other books and tell you a little bit about this book. Crimson Petal in the White takes place in Victorian London. It is mostly about a prostitute named Sugar, although I think that that was a bit of a misconception that I had carried with me into the book because that's basically all I really heard about it. Sugar is a main character, but there are three other main characters that get almost as much, if not sometimes more, screen time than Sugar. William, who is a client of hers, William's wife, Agnes, and William's brother, Henry. And of course there are other smaller players that we also get to see, but those are kind of the four main characters. And I would say for the first half of the novel, it's really William's story, not Sugar's. So I kept waiting for Sugar to do stuff and being kind of disappointed because it was so much about William. And spoiler alert, William's kind of a dick. So I was kind of really over him, but the latter half seems to be more about Sugar and she has more agency in the story and it gets more interesting from there. But that's all I really want to say about the plot because that's all I really knew and I think it was kind of fun to unravel the story itself, but I wouldn't say that this is entirely Sugar's story because we get a lot of other perspectives and I don't think that we really get to contextualize where Sugar is coming from or what she wants and where she's going until much later in the book than I would have anticipated. Another thing that I really wish I had known when I went into this book, this is a book that is very similar to Jane Eyre. That's all I'm going to say about that because I want this to be spoiler free and I don't want to say exactly how it's like Jane Eyre. It takes a lot of elements from Jane Eyre and tweaks them slightly puts them in different contexts and plays with them. It's like, it's definitely playing with a lot of the ideas that Jane Eyre gave to us. And I wish I had known that. I mean, it took me for quite a while to see the connections. There's one really obvious connection that can be made when you get to a certain point in the novel where you're like, oh, Jane Eyre. That is, so it took me a while to kind of make that connection. And then once I saw that, I started seeing other people refer to it in that way. But it's something that I wish I had known before because I think that kind of, diminished my impression of the book. I just feel like he could have done more with that or less with that and I probably would have liked it better. It was an interesting play and you will know exactly what I'm referring to if you've read both Jane Eyre and The Crimson Petal. I don't know if they'll be, they would be as clear if you had only read Crimson Petal and not Jane Eyre. One of the most obvious plays with Jane Eyre is when Michelle Faber actually directly quotes Jane Eyre. There's a really famous line in Jane Eyre that's right at the end and it's a really big spoiler for Jane Eyre so I don't want to say it. It's four words. I, so I don't want to say exactly what the line is but you probably know what I'm referring to if you've read Jane Eyre. Anyway, Michelle Faber directly references that in The Crimson Petal and the White, that line. He, it's very self-aware and quite direct. I just wish that it had been done a little differently. I guess the, the play and some almost parody of Jane Eyre just didn't 
quite work for me. I mean, I really enjoyed this book. It was a good book, but did I didn't love it, and I didn't love Sugar as much as I thought I would have. I know that a lot of people really love Sugar. She was not my favorite character. I definitely found myself connecting more with her and being much more interested in her story overall in the latter half, so I would say that I liked the second half of this book much more than the first, but being almost a thousand pages long, it at times felt like I wasn't really getting anywhere and I do think this book could have been condensed cut by like 200 pages and it would have been better for me but I know a lot of people really love this book so of course these are just my thoughts and opinions and it wasn't necessarily my perfect book but I still quite liked it and it did make me quite intrigued to read more Michelle Faber I know that the book of strange new things got a lot of buzz in the past year or so and that's one that also interests me quite a lot I probably won't get to it anytime soon but I am still quite intrigued by it I apologize for the camera having moved I realized after filming that I did have one thing that was really important and one of the things that really bothered me about the way it was written was the inconsistent narration I loved the beginning of this book it starts off with a really compelling narration of somebody basically taking you by the wrist and dragging you through the streets and the slums through a brothel and kind of being a serving as a guide for you like you're a character in this landscape so a lot of it is in second person which I was not expecting and I actually found myself to be quite enjoying but this kind of dies out randomly after a hundred pages or so and I understand how it, be, it would be unrealistic to continually refer to jumping in, through different places in time to different settings and taking you to different places and, and to different people because of the the pace definitely quickens uh, as the book progresses so it would be really unrealistic and probably quite jarring for this mysterious narrator to continue dragging you through these places and you kind of sitting as an invisible voyeur watching all these things unfold however I wish that it had somehow been tapered off in a better way or had remained somewhat consistent throughout the novel because it is so well done and compelling in the beginning. It just sucks you right in as a reader, particularly using the, the second person, but then it just goes away and it becomes a really standard narrative third person, not really a whole lot of commentary from the narrator, although occasionally it's there. And I found its inconsistency to really pull me out of the narrative. And when it kind of showed back up here and there, it really messed up the way that I was seeing the story and I wish that it had been cons consistent either one way or the other. Like I, re I really wouldn't want the beginning to be changed because I found it so compelling. However, I don't know how it could have been continued through, so I wish that it wasn't there at all, rather than just kind of showing up randomly and really inconsistently because that inconsistent narrative really drew me out of the story. I thought it was really important to mention that because I'd never really ever heard anybody specifically refer to the narrative and discuss it this way. It's one of the biggest issues that I have with the novel, so I thought that it was important to kind of poke back in here and say that before I totally forgot, because I think that that's kind of key to why this book didn't suck me in as much as I think it possibly could have, and why I didn't love it nearly as much as I had wanted to. So yeah, now the camera's gonna move again because I'm filming this after. I think that was really important to note. So those are my general thoughts on The Crimson Petal and the White. I know that the description of The Fair Fight by Anna Freeman directly references The Crimson Petal and the White and says that if you like The Crimson Petal and the White, you will like The Fair Fight. I have Happen to like the fair fight more so if you enjoyed one and have yet to read the other I would highly recommend that you read them both because I really like them both but I think I've had my fill of Victorian era historical fiction for the time being and uh, I've enjoyed what I've read so far I think it's an interesting genre but I think I've had my fill and I'm ready to read some fantasy or something so I would really be interested to hear people's thoughts on the crimson petal and the white because I wasn't really directly involved in the discussion I would like to hear if you've read it what your thoughts were and how you thought of the characters and particularly the ending I know is controversial. I happen to have had no issues with the ending but I know that some people do so as always I love discussion and I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments or if you have other recommendations for me based on what I've said about the Crimson Petal and the White. I would absolutely welcome people to disagree with me and my lack of, of love for this book 
because again, I didn't dislike it. I really did like it. Like Stephen from Seafree's books, I know that he absolutely adored this book and they just, I didn't happen to connect with it the same way. So yeah, I would love to invite discussion if you have things to say about this book. Otherwise, I will see you next time. Thanks for watching. Bye.